Animations in your video game. Visually, it's probably one of the more important things you need to do. It really makes your game feel alive. But from a development standpoint, at least for me, it's definitely the most tedious. And it's probably why I haven't done an animation video yet till this point. I kind of hate doing it. But that's not the attitude. It's supposed to be fun. So let's go ahead and show you how you can set this up by using movement. And we're going to be doing eight direction movement, but that shouldn't discourage you. You can do any directions you want. Just kind of learn the concept here and how it works. Oh, and we're also going to be using sprite sheet animation. We talked about in our character customization tutorial how that works as opposed to skeletal. So if you want to refresh on that, go ahead and watch that video. So all we have in this scene is our player and our player movement script that we created in the 2D top down movement tutorial. Our player just has a rigid body and I'll show the script in a bit, but basically we can just move in eight directions. We're using a white square, but let's change this. Let's go ahead and import our sprite sheets we want to use and animate on. And I'm not much of an artist, so I found these on opengameart.org. It's just two sprite sheets, one for idle animation and one for running. So in Unity, I'm going to go ahead and import these two sprite sheets. And if you click on these sprite sheets, it'll actually assume this is just one single sprite image. So our first step is to actually convert this down into multiple different pieces. And Unity makes this pretty easy for us. Before we break this down though, let's change some of the settings down here. We'll change the filter mode from bilinear to point, and for compression, we'll select none and hit apply. And you'll notice up here that our sprite mode is currently single. So let's go ahead and set this to multiple, hit apply, and open up the sprite editor. So here we have all our rows and columns of the sprites in the sprite sheet, and we wanna break each one of these out into their own individual piece. I'll go change this from the color mode to black and white, just for clarity. And we can open up this slice tool at the top left. And they do have an automatic slicer, and we could try that out. It'll basically identify objects based on their pixels and crop out based on the width and height of the pixels it finds. But this will actually give us imprecise croppings. This is a 256 by 256 sprite sheet. So I actually can figure this out and know that each cell size should be 32 by 32 pixels. And if we slice it, you'll notice this looks pretty uniform and even. So you'll have to figure out what dimensions make sense for your sprite sheet. But in general, you do want to keep these sizes uniform. This is so you don't have your sprite moving around as it animates through each one of these frames. After you get the cropping you like, make sure you hit apply at the top right. And now in our assets folder, if we expand this idle sheet, you'll notice we can now cycle through all the different individual images and drag them in one by one. In fact, we can just drag one of these in here and now it will act the same as if you dragged in a single sprite. You'll notice that the sprite's a little smaller than our square, and while you could increase the scale of this object, a better solution is to change the pixels per unit field. So if we select on our idle sheet, you'll notice pixels per unit is 100. We could change this to something like 32 and hit apply, and you'll notice it becomes much larger. And this will be the same for any of the different sprites in the sprite sheet, so it does it across all of them. So each one of these directions has eight frames of animation, so I can select from zero to seven and shift click, and you'll notice each one is highlighted. And if I just drag all seven of these sprites in, it'll ask you to make a new animation. So I'll call this something like player idle up. And if we hit play, our animation will actually start playing on its own. Not only does it create an animation, it also creates an animation controller, which we don't need, but we'll clean this up in a little bit. For now, let's just go through and make animations for each one of our direction. So we already did up, if we go to the next one, it looks like it's going to be facing up and to the right. And so we can select idle sheet 8 and shift click down to 15 and drag it in. We'll call this player idle. I'm just going to abbreviate it as UR for upper right. Then I'll do the same for the next, which is, should be 16 to 23. Shift click, drag it in. Player idle right. And I think you get the picture at this point. So I'm just going to go ahead and finish off the rest of these. Okay, so we set up all eight directions with their animations. Our player is still this box, and we'll eventually change that, but we'll worry about that later. And you'll notice we have all of our animations, but like I said before, we have all these different animation controllers. We can just go ahead and delete all the animation controllers. We don't need any of them. And we can actually delete these game objects that generated too. So we have our eight game objects, we'll delete those. We'll select our player. And I'll select one of the downward facing sprites, which in my sprite sheet is 32. So now we just have a static sprite. In our assets folder, I'll create a new folder and I'll call this animations. 
And I'll just select our eight directions that we created and put them in there. We're done with the idle sheet at this point, but we still have this run sheet. So let's go ahead and do the same exact thing. And we'll step through this really quickly. We'll select it. We'll select multiple pixels per unit. will go from 100 to 32 like before. We'll change the filter mode to point and we'll set compression to none and hit apply. We'll open the sprite editor and go to slice and type in grid by cell size. And for this sprite sheet, we'll do 32 by 32. But again, you'll have to slice yours based on what you're using. This is just what works for my sprite sheet. We'll hit apply. We'll expand it. Run should be more exciting. So let's go ahead and do the same thing. We'll select the first one, shift click eight down, drag it in. And we'll call this player run up. We'll select eight to 15, drag it in. Call this player run up right. This spreadsheet has the same dimensions, so it's gonna be eight frames for each. I'm gonna go ahead and do the rest of them really quickly. There we go, we got all eight directions running in place. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a new folder in my animation folder and call this running. Set up your directory however you want. I'm not gonna expand this after this tutorial, so I'm just gonna keep this simple. But basically you should have 16 animations if you're doing eight directions. You should have as many animations as directions you plan on having. And same thing as before, we have all these different controllers. We can go ahead and delete these animation controllers. We can delete the eight game objects that were created when we dragged in the sprites. And we should just be left with our player. And so now we can go ahead and set up our own animation controller now that we got a lot of the tedious work out of the way. And so we'll hit add component and we'll add an animator and I'll right click on assets and create a new animator controller. And we'll call this player controller. And we'll just go ahead and drag this into the controller field within the animator. We can double click it to open it up. Okay, here we go. So here's our player animator, not much is going on. You have layers, and then you also have parameters, which is going to be important in a little bit. How the animator works is you drag in animations, which we created before. So I just dragged in three random ones. This is a state machine. So on entry, it will default to one of your animations. And then you can make transitions between one to the other and using parameters in the animator. So you could create floats, integers, bools, and triggers. You can actually use these to create transitions between one state to the next. So from one idle animation to the next, or from idle to running, to walking, to jumping, to attacking, all those could be different states. And while we definitely could drag in all eight of our idle animations and then set up transitions between them, this would be kind of stupid and a lot of tedious work. And we've already done all the tedious work, so we don't want to do this anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and delete everything. Unity actually has a nice tool for handling all different directions as part of one type of animation. So instead of having eight idle animations, right, we could just have one state called idle and use a blend tree to determine what direction we should be using. So if you right click and hit create state from new blend tree, it'll create something called a blend tree and we can rename this to just idle and we can double click this which will take us into the blend tree. If you select this blend tree node, you'll see that we have something called a blend type. And right now this is one dimensional, but we have a few other options. Before we choose one, we need to first create some parameters. So we'll select our parameters tab. We'll hit the plus button and we'll make a float. And I'll call this anim move x. And I'll make another float and call this anim move y. Pay attention to your casing here. We're eventually gonna use these later on in script, but you need to use magic strings to actually relate these, unfortunately. Okay, so now with two floats created, we can click on our blend tree with these two parameters made, and we'll change the blend type from one dimensional to 2D simple directional. We now have these things called parameters that show up. We can now use our newly created parameters. Uh, so I'll set these to anim move X and anim move Y. And now we just have a empty list of motions, which is another term for animations. So we can actually click on the plus and select add motion field. And now we're able to fill this motion field with an animation. Just hang in there with me for a second. Let's go ahead and fill out seven more motion fields. I'm just gonna click the plus and hit add motion field till we have eight. All right, so we have eight motion fields that are empty and we have these X and Y coordinates. Let's go ahead and fill up these eight motion fields with our different direction for animations. So let's do idle first. So you can just drag and drop your animations in or you can select them and pick from the list. 
but I'm just gonna go from right all the way in a 360. Okay, so we have all eight animations plugged in, but you'll notice we have this new window here that shows points on the map. The red point is the center of zero, zero. All these blue points show the different motions that we have. Now, if you remember your seventh grade math, what we'll need to do is put in x, y coordinates for each one of these directions. For example, we know that for the right direction, it's one in the x-axis and zero in the y-axis. And the point will actually move to that to show us. And so for down right, we would know that is one in the x and negative one in the y. For down, that would be zero in the x and negative one in the y. Down left, it would be negative one, negative one. Left would be negative one, zero. Upper left would be negative one, one up would be zero one. And when you're done, you should have all eight directions filled with a blue point. If yours does not look like this, then you're doing something wrong. So make sure you fill this out correctly. Okay, so we have our idle blend tree done here. And on entry, we'll be going to the idle state. But let's go ahead and wire this up in the script so we can actually test to see if it's working. I'm gonna go ahead and open up my player movement script, which is what we created in the last tutorial. Basically just have a move speed float and we use the rigid body. This process inputs and move function is all we're really doing. Feel free to take a second and pause this and fill out your script to match what's here if you didn't do the first tutorial. And if you want to understand it better, go ahead and watch that tutorial first. We're then just calling these methods in update and fix update. Okay, so we are calculating our move X and move Y from our inputs in process inputs. But now we actually want to go ahead and pass these values to our animator and map that to the animator variables. So the first thing we need is actually a reference to our animator. Under our rigid body, I'll say public animator anim, and we'll make a new method called void animate. What we're basically gonna end up doing is process our inputs and then using our move direction variable, we'll pass in the X and Y of that into our animator. What we wanna say is anim, which is our variable, that set float. And now you have to match the string name of your animator variable exactly, casing matters. So I'll say anim move x. For the float value, I'll say move direction dot x. And same thing for y, anim dot set float. And then the name of it is anim move y. We'll say move direction dot y. In our update call, after process inputs, we'll say animate. In the Unity editor, we'll select our player and make sure that the animator controller is passed in to the variable. So you can just click on our animator and drag it into the field. Okay, so the view is a little weird here, but we're playing the game. We'll notice our idle animations going. And as we move, you'll see that our X and Y values are changing and that our player is constantly updating, which is great. We, it looks like we're hitting all eight directions but we are only playing our idle animation when we should be doing our running animation. So that was idle. Let's do the same exact thing for running. We'll right click and create a new state from blend tree. We'll select it and rename it running and change the blend type from 1D to 2D simple direction. We'll use anim move X, anim move Y. We'll add eight motion fields. We'll drag in our animations. And then we'll set our X, Y coordinates the same as the idle. And so you should have the same eight corners filled. Now it's worth noting, if you don't have eight directions, you only have, let's say four, you should still have the eight directions. And then for your corners, you should just use the left and right animations. So for like upper left and down left, you should just use left facing animation and vice versa for the right side. So we have our idle blend tree and our running blend tree with all 16 animations hooked up total. We now wanna transition between the two. We could make a bool called is moving and then using our inputs in our script, determine if we're moving and set the bool true or false. That's a totally fine way of doing it. And I would encourage that 100%. But since we're already using movement direction, the X and Y of that only gets populated if we're trying to move. So we can actually just check the magnitude of that vector to determine if we're moving or not. So what we could do is create a float and I'll call this anim move magnitude. And then I'll select idle and right click and make transition to running and select this white arrow that is created between it. There's a list of conditions, so I'll add one. And we can use our list of variables here 
So I'll select n and move magnitude, which we just created. And if our magnitude is greater than 0.1, then we know that we should be running. And conversely, I'll select running and right click and make transition back to idle. And then select that transition. We'll create a new condition. We'll use n and move magnitude. And we'll say if it's less than 0.1, which means it's basically zero, it should only be less if we're not moving anymore, then we wanna go back to our idle animation. In our script, we can go back to our animate method. We just need to add one more line. We can say anim.setfloat anim move magnitude. Make sure your spelling and casing is correct. And we'll say move direction dot magnitude. Okay, we're back to this small tiny view, but you'll notice now as we start moving, we actually transition from idle to running. And if we stop, then it will transition back. You'll notice there's like a little bit of lag though. Uh, and that's because if we select this transition, you'll see that there's a transition period that looks like it takes almost a fifth of a second to process. So we, where this blue pane is here, we can shrink this down to nothing and select has exit time, we'll uncheck that. And we'll do the same for the transition from running to idle. We'll shrink the transition time and it doesn't have exit time. We'll save. Uh, and we're basically saying we just want these to transition states immediately. You could also have actually like a transition animation between states, but that's too advanced for what we're doing here. And so now it's much snappier. As soon as you stop moving, you'll notice he just stops right away. And at this point, you could call it a day since we are animating in all eight directions. But you'll notice when we actually stop moving, we always just face the same direction. And that's because we're not actually capturing what our last movement was. So there's one more step we have to do if we want our player to actually face the direction we were last moving in. If you don't want that, you could just call it a day here. But let's quickly set that up. So back in our player movement script, what we want to do is when we stop moving, we want to capture what our last move direction inputs were and store that off. So what we'll do is create a new vector2. So private vector2, and we'll call this last move direction. In process inputs, after we capture our move x and move y from our input, we want to make a new if statement and do a check. So this one's kind of weird, but what we want to say is if move x is equal to zero and move y is equal to zero, which means we're not pressing any inputs anymore, so we're not moving, uh, we want to double parentheses this. So this is the first case. So if we're not moving anymore and our move direction dot x does not equal zero or our move direction dot y does not equal to zero, then we want to say last move direction is equal to move direction. Now this might be kind of weird, but basically in this first parentheses bracket here, if we're not moving anymore and there's still values stored in our move direction, then we want to capture those values. Otherwise, if we didn't have this check at the end here, it's basically just gonna keep storing zero for last move direction every single time. Okay, back in our animator, we'll create two new float variables. So we'll say anim last move x and anim last move y. We'll double click on our idle and select our blend tree. And instead of anim move x and anim move y, we'll use anim last move x and anim last move y. Then back in our animate method of our script, we can then do the same thing as before. We can say anim dot set float. We can say anim last move x. And it's this time we want to use last move direction dot x. And same thing for the y. Anim dot set float. Anim last move y. Last move direction dot y. And so now with everything hooked up, when you move in a direction and you stop, you should now continue facing that direction, which is exactly what we want. So this basically wraps up our tutorial. Setting up your animations I find very tedious, but you do get a nice reward for putting in all that effort because it does look nice and it feels great once you actually get it working. So I hope this video helped you out. Definitely leave comments if you have any questions. If you're having troubles or you just want to talk about projects, feel free to join the Discord. We have channels dedicated to helping people out. And make sure you subscribe for more content to come. I have a whole lineup of videos coming on the way, so make sure you stick around for those. All right, thanks, bye.